How to rebuild a Stuart Models 5A steam engine, and this is part 13. Cylinder top cover fixings, steam chest gaskets, and fitting inlet and exhaust manifolds. On screen at the moment, this is definitely not a Stuart 5A steam engine. This is something I bought recently. It was extremely cheap, and it's fairly nasty in places. It's called an arbor press. Apart from the play in the shaft, I do not like this part. This allows you to clamp the handle in a fixed position, but it's very, very sharp. You could easily cut yourself very badly on it. So I modified an old wheel that I had in the workshop, and this does a much better job, and it's safe. I will be using this tool very infrequently, and I'm aware that it was very cheap indeed, so I'm not really complaining. Now onto the job in hand. I'm going to make some studs to secure the top cylinder cover to the cylinder. On most Stuart 5As that I've seen and worked on, the top cylinder cover's been held in place by 2BA bolts. Personally, I've never liked the look of 2BA bolts around the top of the cylinder cover, so I'm going to make some studs. First of all, I bought some 2BA studding from Blackgate's Engineering. Then I cut the stud into length on my bandsaw. I need to make eight of these studs. You could say it's a type of model mass production. I'm only rounding one end of these studs the end that is visible. And the other thing, of course, I forgot to mention, they're not going to be studs. These are just going to be fancy bolts that look like studs. I'm going to speed up the video for this part of the operation. My brain does not cope very well with repeat processes like this. So thanks to the miracle, which is digital video, I can speed it up and get it out of the way quickly. And then it's over to the polishing spindle. All I'm doing here is polishing up the ends of these studs. Just so they look nice, they're very visible, they sit right on top of the engine, so I don't want them to look horrible, I want them to look very nice indeed. A quick health and safety warning, when doing a job of this type, you must wear eye protection, because these studs do look very nice, but they won't look very nice if they hit you in the eye. And by eye protection, I mean safety glasses of some type, not a blindfold. As I mentioned earlier, I really do not like repeat processes of machining operations, but I don't mind this operation for some reason. I think my brain is otherwise engaged coping with the fact that these pieces of metal are very hot and are currently burning my fingers. So why don't I wear gloves? I've mentioned this before, it's because I like to know where my fingers are at all times. So, here's the plan. I've got the studs and I have some 2BA nuts, so I'm locked tight in the 2BA nuts onto the studs and I'm making sure that the amount of stud protruding from the end of the 2BA nut is the same on every one of them. And by holding the studs together like this, I can see whether they're both the same length. And at this stage, it's possible to alter the position of the nut relative to the stud before the Loctite 603 grabs. Making studs this way is not really suitable for a lot of applications, but it's fine for just holding the top cylinder cover in place. In this clip I'm making a minute adjustment to the length of stud sticking out of the top of the 2BA bolt. With the small scale mass production out of the way, it's time to first of all fit the gasket and then fit the top cylinder cover to the cylinder. And here are the dummy bolts going in. I do think that studs around the top cylinder cover, whether the dummy ones or real ones, look much better than bolts. It's very important, of course, not to over tighten these studs. Because if you do that and they shear off, you're going to have a problem. One of these stud bolts would not tighten fully down into the hole, so I checked the depth of the hole and it was slightly shallower than the rest. So all I did was grind a bit off the end of the bolt and then refit it. As you can clearly see, I'm not using my reliable and trusty and wonderful backhoe spanner for tightening these bolts. Instead I'm using this spanner, and this is a really good spanner. It's got a very sharp edge, so it only allows you to put so much pressure on the bolt before you feel severe pain in your finger. And before you actually shear off the bolt, the pain in the finger is so severe, you can't put any more pressure on to do that. This spanner is a tool for the masochistic model engineer. This is what the top cylinder cover originally looked like, so I think the effort of remachining it has been worthwhile. The next job is to make some gaskets for the steam chest and the steam chest cover. So I'm using two pieces of gasket material. I simply draw around the steam chest cover on the gasket material and then drill the holes through both pieces of gasket material and cut them out. On screen at the moment I'm cutting out the centre of the gaskets. I'm doing these one at a time because I can't put a lot of pressure on 
with this small scalpel. In answer to a query that I got from a viewer, the genuine Swan Morton blades, but they will still fracture if you put too much pressure on them. So once again, you should always wear eye protection when doing this job. Really, I only need to cut out the centre of the gasket that's going to be between the steam chest and the cylinder. But I always cut out the gasket that fits on the steam chest cover. Otherwise, the centre, unsupported part of the gasket, when it's in service, can fall to pieces over time and get in the way of the slide valve. In this clip, I'm fitting the studs to the cylinder block. When I first dismantled the engine, I noticed that these studs were loose. They were only really into the cylinder, finger tight. I put them in a little bit tighter than that, but now the steam chest is more of a tight fit, and it needed a gentle tap with a soft hammer to seat it. After a quick check to make sure nothing's moved and everything's running freely, it's time to trim off the excess gasket material from around the edge of the steam chest. I'm making the exhaust manifold gasket in exactly the same way, so I won't labour the point. I didn't drill the holes, I just used a hole punch to cut out the holes, and I'm having to use multiple applications of the hole punch to cut out the centre, followed by a quick run round with a small drum sander to clean it up. Now I don't really need to do this because nobody sees it, but I would know it was there, so it's just worth going the extra mile to make the job perfect. Well, maybe not perfect, but just to make it a proper job. Once I've trimmed the excess gasket material from around the cylinder cover, the whole job is going to look pretty good. Even though the box bed that the engine sits on needs another coat of paint, I thought it would temporarily fit the flywheel, bolt the engine to the box bed and see what it's going to look like. And it's looking good. And I can't believe how smooth it's running. It's not clunky. It's very smooth indeed. At this stage I thought I would fit a compressed air line and see whether there was any blowing, and no there's none at all. This engine really is going to run well and will be extremely powerful. I originally fitted the eccentric sheaves to the engine with some very small 2BA grub screws. So then I went and bought some longer 2BA grub screws. These are 3 quarters of an inch long, which is a little bit too long, so I used my 1 inch belt sander to shorten them. I made them shorter by a quarter of an inch and now they fit the eccentric sheaves perfectly. I've mentioned this before, but I will repeat myself, because it's essential for the setting of the valves. For the initial valve setting and positioning of the slide valve, the eccentric sheave must be set at 90 degrees to the crank pin, and that is the highest point of the eccentric. And in this case, it's the part of the eccentric that has the grub screw in it. And this is the way I would do it on any model steam engine. If the steam engine that you're timing does not have any reversing gear, it's even simpler. You have one eccentric sheave, that has to be at 90 degrees to the crank pin, and depending on which side of the crank web you set the position of the eccentric to, depends which way the engine spins. And if you're wanting to set the timing of a steam engine that is fitted with reversing valve gear, the principle is the same. You put the first eccentric in position, the high point of the eccentric has to be at 90 degrees to the crank pin on one side of the crank web, and the other eccentric sheave has to be at 90 degrees to the crank pin, but the high point of the eccentric has to point towards the other side of the crank web. And what this means in real terms is that the pair of eccentric sheaves are 180 degrees out of phase to each other. For the answers to a lot of steam based questions, there are two ways to go. You could just muddle through and figure it out, or you could have a look on my daughter's website, which is www.steamclinic.com. The website has a free forum, but the main benefits are my daughter Charlotte will be answering the steam based questions in the form of a video, and Charlotte will be making a steam clinic video once a week. A lot of the answers will come from my book of steam, which keeps disappearing from the workshop. And if you're interested in getting your own book of steam, or a quality leather bound book with a theme of your own choice, they're available from www.blackorchardleather.com. And that's it for now, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.